So this is actually a, a project I'm I'm working on right now at the moment. Um, so feedback is is very welcome. Um, so I don't know if you if you're aware of my work or could just see behind me, uh, but my my previous book, Nihilism and Technology. Um, people asked me uh, whenever I gave talks on the book, okay, so what, what do we do about the nihilism? Uh, and I said, well, that's not my problem. I'm a philosopher. Um, but weirdly, they kept expecting an answer. Um, so that's what I'm working on now. And I found uh, Simone de Beauvoir as, as, I think, a good resource to think about that. Uh, so that's what tonight's talk will be about. So first, uh, talking about the relationship between technology and paternalism. Uh, if you look, for example, at the uh, industrial design program that we have here at the University of Twente, uh, I noticed right on the main website, it says that the goal is to uh, teach people how to become a designer so they can enrich people's lives. Um, and this is something I've been teaching in our industrial design program for eight years. Uh, and this is something I've, I've seen uh, as, a, as a problem students have uh, uh, where they do want to intervene, they do want to help people, they do want to help the world. Uh, but at the same time, they're very much aware of the threat of paternalism, uh, the threat of, of being seen as uh, not just helping people uh but but infantilizing people by by providing what they think of as what should help them so of course uh this is my drawing of john stuart mill i i apologize um but if you if you know mill uh you probably know this uh famous principle of mills uh what's known as the harm principle uh where he says it on liberty uh, that freedom is only meaningful when we can do what we want. And of course, the only time you can interfere with anyone else's freedom is to prevent them from interfering with someone else's freedom. So very clearly doing it to, can you see my cursor when I move it? Yeah, okay. So trying to, to actually help people is not, uh, according to Mill, a justification uh, that actually is an impediment to freedom. So this is the kind of model of society we get from Mill. Uh, we are free when we are able to have a private sphere uh, where we can do whatever we want and where uh, people uh, keep their sphere out of your sphere. So uh, this is what gives us the sense of paternalism, that whenever you're telling me what I should do or try to prevent me from harming myself, uh, you're acting like my father, hence the, the potter of paternalism. But what I've noticed, uh, if you look at technologies, and you're, you're probably familiar with them, uh, increasingly technologies are indeed interfering, uh, and not just interfering, but doing it precisely in, in this attempt to make our lives better. Uh, so if you're familiar with Philips and Eindhoven, uh, they've been pioneering uh, smart lighting technologies as a way to make, uh, first of all, how to make employees more efficient, more productive. This has been so successful that now you can buy it for your own home. Uh, this is called Philips Hue. So maybe you've seen uh, multiple Black Friday uh, sales of these lights. Maybe you have them at your home. Um, I, I do appreciate as an American that, that you don't have Thanksgiving, but you do have Black Friday. So it's, it's a completely meaningless holiday here, but you, you've taken it anyway. And, I, and you, you don't actually buy anything because you're not capitalist, but it is nice anyway. Um, at the same time, uh, we increasingly have smart watches uh, that tell you uh, get off the couch, uh, meditate, uh, you know, again, trying to make you a better person, make you a healthier person. Uh, Google Maps increasingly isn't just telling you how to get where you want to go, but it's telling you how to get to where it wants you to go. Uh, so it guides you on not just eco-friendly routes, uh, but increasingly people can also uh, advertise in the map itself. Uh, so it can guide you to go along a route near where people have paid uh, advertisements. 
Uh, and of course, everyone's favorite, uh, whenever you try to pick a password, you think that it's your password, and then the website always reminds you, no, it's, it's not, you idiot. Uh, you do the password that we want, and until you meet our standards of security, you cannot have your own password. So again, technology is increasingly interfering with our freedom, but we seem not to mind because it's not human. So because uh, people have discovered that not only can technologies interfere with us, but that people don't seem to mind it, uh, academics increasingly have been leaning into this. Uh, famously, Taylor and Sunstein have leaned into this in their famous book, Nudges, uh, creating uh, this great oxymoronic phrase uh, that they're advocating libertarian paternalism. So this seems like a contradiction because uh, these would be two completely opposing views that they've mashed together. But they argue uh, because it's technology interfering and because it's technology interfering in a way that you can refuse, so it's not coercive, it's okay. So this is, um, you've probably heard of this, uh, it's a bestseller, Nobel Prize winning idea. Their justification, uh, is that basically all of us have a little Homer Simpson inside of us. Uh, and why not, uh, again, lean into that? Why not basically make our lives easier? Uh, so rather than trying to activate the Lisa Simpson inside of you uh, and making life more complicated, activate the Homer Simpson inside of you. Uh, when I was a kid, we called this the lizard brain, uh, but they've made it nicer, the Homer brain. Uh, and again, uh, you see this, for example, uh, at supermarkets uh, where they put the healthier food at the front of the store. You've probably noticed this uh, at your local Albert Hein, uh, Jumbo, Aldi. Uh, they, they still sell you bad food, but it's, it's not as easy to find as the healthy food. Uh, you've also probably seen um, what is the default option? This is another uh, Thaler and Sunstein famous idea. Um, make the opt, uh, make the opt in option uh, the safer one. Make the opt out one the more precarious one, so that uh, again, if you're too busy, too overwhelmed, you don't accidentally lose your health insurance because you didn't renew it. And this has been so successful uh, that we now see nudge units. Uh, have, have taken over the world. So uh, governments all over the world have now employed nudges, uh, including, of course, the Netherlands. Uh, so maybe, maybe you're not aware of nudges, but nudges are aware of you. But if you know Hannah Arendt, um, you would know she would be opposed to this idea. Uh, you know, she, she's more a Lisa Simpson than a Homer Simpson. And she argues that basically what, what uh, happens from a libertarian perspective, uh, so from Mill's perspective, um, is that we create a world that she calls a desert world, where again, because we're all trapped in our private spheres, uh, we increasingly um, only care about ourselves, only think uh, that life is good when, when I take care of myself. Uh, and so because of this, when something does go wrong, uh, we are taught, uh, as she argues from psychology, uh, to think the problem is with us rather than the problem is with the world. So fix yourself to adapt to the desert world rather than try to fix the desert world itself. Uh, so again, uh, when she was writing uh, one of the best-selling books in the world, The Power of Positive Thinking, uh, this idea, again, if something's wrong, uh, why not just be more optimistic? rather than try to be more political. And I argue that this is uh, what nudges are offering us, uh, what I call desert technology. Uh, so again, in the same way that psychology tries to fix you, not the world, and not take up a political position, uh, increasingly technologies are operating in this way too, trying to help us adapt to the world rather than try to fix the world. So given uh, this, this uh, opposition, uh, as we all know, of course, whenever there are Americans and Germans fighting, we turn to the French. So Simone de Beauvoir uh, tells us we can do both. 
and that's what we need to figure out. Uh, if we turn to Simone de Beauvoir uh, in her Ethics of Ambiguity from 1948, she tells us that to be human is to be ambiguous. So very importantly, uh, this idea that we are um, all of these things, that we, we cannot, uh, as we so often like to do, we cannot define ourselves only by one half or the other. Uh, even though she calls this a tragedy, it's still um, true whether we like it or not that we just are all of these things. So this is why she argues um, against her critics who say that existentialism denies ethics. She says actually existentialism is the only ethics uh, because existentialism is the only philosophy that actually takes human ambiguity seriously. So. If we look at uh, deontological ethics, for example, it only looks at uh, the subjective, conscious, transcendent aspect and tells us to rationally obey dictates of ethics, regardless of situation. On the other hand, if you look at consequentialist ethics, they look only at the other side, only care about physiological, psychological research to determine best outcomes. What you hope to achieve is irrelevant because it's just not realistic. So existential ethics says, uh, no, both of those are wrong. They are not human. And because of our embracing of ambiguity, we get uh, two uh, ethical principles. We must embrace freedom. Sorry, we must embrace freedom and we must fight oppression. So that's what it means to be ethical from an existential or at least from a Beauvoirian standpoint. And importantly uh, for her definition of freedom, she also, um, does not take Mill's libertarian sense of freedom. Instead, she argues that this zero-sum view is wrong. Very important uh, to her argument is this idea that for me to be free, I need you to be free. So rather than thinking that the larger your sphere of freedom becomes, the smaller mine is from a million perspective. Instead, the understanding is the more you're able to achieve, the more opportunities you create for others to achieve. So even if I'm just a selfish bastard, I still want you to be free in order to help my own freedom. So this is uh, the real picture. I not only want to embrace my freedom, in other words, I also have to embrace your freedom. <coughs> Sorry, it's been a long day. <clears throat> So, uh, because we are Dutch, uh, we of course have to ask then, uh, what about technology? So where does technology fit in to this picture of ethics? Uh, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with this picture. I, I, uh, when I first saw it, I thought it was fake, but it, apparently this is, this is a real photo of uh, Sartre and de Beauvoir uh, having fun with guns. I assume this is when they were touring America, but I, I can't prove it. So um, from what I can tell, uh, I've not seen anyone else um, write about Simone de Beauvoir's view on technology, but if you look closely, she does actually make some interesting arguments about technology. Uh, and again, this is 1948, uh, so not the same kind of technology we have today. Um, the examples given here, airplanes, machines, telephone, radio, but still, I think we get um, a view relevant for today, this idea that technologies promise uh, things that they do not actually realize. Uh, so they promise they're going to make your life better, they're going to make you happier, they're going to make you more efficient, they're going to make you more comfortable. Uh, but of course, that's just not reality. And that's why you have an iPhone 14 and not an iPhone 1. On the other hand, uh, she also argues very importantly uh, that one of the reasons uh, the, the, the proletarian worker has not embraced the Marxist call for revolution uh, is because diversions, uh, so again, gadgets, uh, are something that allow you to feel free rather than to be free. So because you own things uh, that are associated with freedom, you can pretend you're free and then go back to work the next day and ignore it because it helps you to buy your Christmas presents. Sorry, your, your Pacquiao's Avon present. So, a uh, very clear view. 
technologies offer uh, a fantasy of fulfillment, uh, and this creates a danger of nihilism, according to Simone de Beauvoir, uh, because for her, um, uh, when we have fantasies that do not become real, uh, we keep chasing the fantasy until either we reject the fantasy or we reject the, the idea of ever being fulfilled. So either we become ethical and realize this was a bad fantasy, or we become nihilistic and say meaningfulness, fulfillment just isn't possible. So this is why it's very dangerous uh, to embrace this fantasy or sorry, to promote this fantasy. However, she does not go fully into technology is nihilistic, technology is bad. Um, she does appreciate uh, that for us to be free, freedom must be something we concretely realize in the world. And to concretely realize uh, activity in the world, it's going to involve technology. So technology is not the boogeyman. Uh, technology is something we need to be free. Uh, it's something not only to help us realize our freedom, but also to promote freedom. So there is a possibility uh, in her, her view for technology to be ethical if it uh, promotes freedom. So if it raises awareness of our condition, if it creates possibilities, if it reduces our complacency and most importantly reduces the oppression of ourselves and others. So based on what we've seen before, this tells us again, I use technology to promote my own freedom. That seems pretty clear. Uh, you know, you pick up tools, you make something you want, you feel free. Uh, but how technologies help us to achieve the freedom of others, that's less clear. So I started looking around uh, for anyone in the world of design who actually had a picture of uh, embracing freedom through their design. And I found this project uh, in the United States uh, called Freedom by Design. Uh, so it was, it was perfect uh, for what I was looking for. Uh, and here is an overview of this uh, project uh, created by students, uh, architecture students. So this has been going on now uh, for about seven or eight years. Uh, it started in Colorado, but has since spread all over the United States. Um, so it's been very successful. And they seem to promote something like a Beauvoirian existential idea uh, that we should use technology, use design to promote the freedom of others. And that the way to do that is by engaging with real people in the real world. So it, it seems like they're doing exactly what Beauvoir would want. Uh, what I did find interesting though, was at no point uh, in any of their literature, and I looked through their entire 40 page manual, uh, at no point do they actually define freedom. Now, you might say, of course, well, they're architecture students, they're not philosophy students. Uh, what do you expect? They're gonna take freedom for granted. They do give us this idea that if you uh, remove these barriers to freedom, that freedom would be realized. Uh, but again, there's, there's an implicit rather than explicit understanding of freedom. So why might that be a problem? I looked at one specific project they did uh, this was in Colorado, uh, where they responded to uh, these these campsites. This is uh, very American, um, but basically there's a homeless problem in Denver. Uh, the Denver City Council said, well, we can make a camp for homeless people, uh, get them off the street, uh, put them in a safe space. Uh, but they were given essentially fishing tents uh, to live in. These design students said, well, we're designers, we can do better than that. Uh, and I liked, uh, importantly, that they recognized that this, this was a, a, a dignity issue, right? That this, this wasn't just about shelter, but this is also about what it means to be human, right? But what that meant in reality, uh, again, was, was creating uh, hand-washing stations, healthier gathering pace, and waterproofing the shelter. So this is from um, their uh, grant proposal, uh, which was approved. And again, there's no definition of freedom. Uh, there is this concept of dignity, as we talked about. Um, but importantly, their, their realization of dignity is still very much tied to just the structure. Uh, so what you build. 
So what you might think about when you're thinking about freedom and homelessness is the problem isn't the quality of the shelter. Uh, the problem is that you're homeless. Uh, so you're not really promoting freedom. Uh, you're just making it a little bit nicer to be oppressed. So again, if we go back to the Arendtian perspective, uh, we still see this as more of a, of a desert psychological, desert technological, rather than political response. Uh, and if we go back to Beauvoir, again, we see that this is uh, offering us, again, better comfort and better happiness, but not actually doing anything to change the situation. Uh, so what do we do? Do we say that, well, um, these are designers, what do you expect? They can't uh, involve themselves in politics. They can only involve themselves in design. Um, because if that's the defense, then it seems like we just have to give up any notion of design being political and that freedom can only be superficial, that it, it cannot mean anything concrete. Um, so I, I don't like that view. And I think Beauvoir would actually help us to have a more political way of thinking about what design can do. So again, this problem, how do we help other people? Uh, and what's interesting is, um, uh, you know, she, she can predict uh, that if you've read an ethics book, you're going to expect answers. Um, but importantly, she says, I, ethics does not furnish recipes. Um, so she compares ethics to science and to art and to say that, you know, in the same way you wouldn't ask a scientist, uh, you know, how do you win a Nobel Prize? And you wouldn't ask an artist, uh, how can I make Guernica? Uh, you shouldn't act, ask an ethicist, how do I be good? So again, uh, she compares ethics to science and to art to say that in, in all of these cases, uh, you know, the key is that we, we have to actually try and we have to risk failure. So you cannot know the outcome in advance as much as we would want to. So in other words, we should stop thinking of ethics as we have thought of ethics now as just checklists. I'm on ethics committees. Uh, I am on committees that produce these checklists. Uh, so I am, I am part of the problem. I'm not part of the solution from a Bavarian perspective. Uh, but I do think it's important how much um, ethics has become synonymous with checklists, how much designers um, or really practitioners in any field just take for granted that the role of the ethicist is to create a checklist and then assess your project, whatever that project is, in accordance with the checklist. And the idea that if I can check everything you gave me to do, then I am ethical. And if anything unethical happens, well, that's not on me. I did the checklist. So that's either the fault of the ethicist or it's the fault of the user. It's not the fault of the designer. So what should we do then? She says, importantly, we can come up with methods, uh, even if we can't come up with a recipe. So if we go back through her work and we go back to this argument I made earlier about uh, technologies being diversions from freedom, uh, we can at least get the one simple principle, uh, don't design diversions. So if given the opportunity to make something that will make people feel free rather than help people to realize freedom, uh, don't do that. So you see increasingly in te technology companies uh, like Google, uh, where engineers are being more proactive and saying, you know, I, I don't want to be a part of this. I, I won't build this. Um, and I think that's, that's an important step in the right direction. And importantly, um, you know, the justification, well, it's going to get made. Uh, so why not, why not me make it, uh, everyone's favorite justification in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, again, that, that's not good enough, right? You, you have the ability, not just to say no, but to also do so publicly. Uh, so this, this is something important that designers can do. And if we look at someone like Jacques Ellul, uh, another French philosopher around the same time, made the point that you know uh, politics has been replaced by technology. Uh, so already in the 1950s, he was arguing that only tech companies have real power. The problem is they don't want that power, and so we have a political vacuum. 
So when we talk about technocracy, uh, he says that that's not real. Uh, Facebook has immense political power, but they do not want it. They're, they're not going to engage in real politics. Um, so this means that designers have a political role and they have to take it seriously. Um, again, she argues very importantly, um, we do not want to be fascist. So we don't want to force people to act the way we want them to. She's also anti-paternalistic. So we should not try to prevent people from doing the wrong things. Instead, she says, we have to give people reasons to resist. So again, um, rather than trying to manipulate people like we saw with nudges, uh, we should be open rather than trying to be tricky. Uh, we should try to make people aware of oppression and give them reasons to resist their oppression. Uh, she also importantly makes this case, um, you know, it's obviously risky to intervene, intervene in the freedom of others. Uh, but if we don't intervene, uh, then we are complicit in their oppression. So there is no being neutral here. Um, it's also important that this isn't charity work. So intervening isn't uh, just coming in, dropping in and doing something and leaving. But again, because freedom uh, of others is involved in my freedom, uh, I am justified and, I, and I'm required to help people. So again, I have to try to raise the consciousness of people uh, about their oppression. And design is again a, an important way to help people to see the world, to understand the world. And again, as we argued earlier, uh, we have to be able to take risks. So if we're going to be existentialists, we cannot justify uh, our designs by turning to other ethical theories, by turning to authority figures, by turning to traditions. Instead, she says, we have to take the risk of inventing an original solution. So we have to justify our actions somehow, but rather than like we usually do, running around looking for someone else to justify it, we have to be willing to justify it ourselves and to justify it by turning to freedom. So again, uh, increasingly in design, you get this argument for co-design. Uh, so this is a way to, uh, again, appear to avoid paternalism by having workshops with stakeholders. This is everyone's favorite word. Uh, you get stakeholder involved, and then uh, because you're just doing what they, what they asked for, what they told you, um, you're not being paternalistic, but also you're not taking responsibility. Uh, so you're going to blame them if something goes wrong. You're not going to say that this is anything that I'm doing. So this is an argument against that uh, vision of design, against co-design. Uh, this is something my former colleague, Peter Paul Verbeek, liked to argue for a lot. So this is, uh, you know, he left us for Amsterdam, so now I can attack him in public. It's fine. Uh, again, uh, she turns to Ibsen, uh, this great play, The Wild Duck. Uh, if you haven't read it, uh, spoiler alert, this is from the ending. Uh, so this guy uh, goes back home, uh, like you probably have if you went away to school and then came home for the holidays. Uh, you're staying with friends. Uh, you find out that your friend is living a lie. Um, his child isn't really his child. Um, his success at work is actually fake, and people are just trying to make him feel good. So what do you do as a college educated person? You of course uh, immediately dash his illusions and say you're living a lie. Uh, and because this is a play by Ibsen, uh, of course this doesn't end well, it ends in tragedy. So this is, um, you know, Ibsen really liked taking ethical theories and, and trying to realize them. So not a trolley problem, but instead an entire play. Uh, and to say that, you know, there are dangers um, to making people realize that they're living a lot. Um, you might not be helping people when you think you are. Instead, you might be just making them feel completely hopeless. So finally, uh, this idea that we shouldn't just force people to face the truth no matter the consequences, uh, but again, instead, uh, try to make it so the truth can be bearable, uh, changing the situation uh, so like we said with homelessness, you know, it's it's not just going to homeless people and saying, hey, you're homeless. Doesn't that suck? Uh, they, they know that. 
uh, but trying to change the situation uh, so that it could be better for them to, to resist oppression rather than uh, having to suffer. Now, of course, there are going to be a lot of questions. Uh, everyone's favorite question, don't people want diversions? Don't people like diversions? Who, are, who am I to stop people from Netflix and chilling? Um, what if giving reasons doesn't work? How do you know if you're actually raising anyone's consciousness? How do you know if your actions are really justified? And how do you know if you change a situation in order to actually help anybody? But Simone de Beauvoir, being French, uh, of course, tells you this is uh, a good sign. So if you're asking these questions, it's more likely that you're an ethical person. If you're not asking these questions, then we should be worried. So at the very least, we can take away from Beauvoir that if you're worried, if you're skeptical, if you're paranoid, you're probably an ethical person. Uh, and if there's someone you work with who's very self-assured and very certain, uh, you should probably watch out for that person. So, uh, as I said, this is something that I'm working on uh, with a colleague to make into a paper. Uh, this is something I'm turning into a grant proposal. So feedback is welcome. Uh, thank you very much.